Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Shane Melanson and we're gonna be talking all about commercial and industrial real estate. Uh, I'm so excited that Shane's here to share his knowledge on this subject. Shane is a seasoned real estate investor with a ton of knowledge, but he's gonna niche out today and talk about this one specific topic for me. And I really appreciate that. Before we get into it with Shane, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, Let's get into it. Shane, thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join us. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do as a real estate investor. Sure. Well, I won't um, bore your audience with like the whole backstory of where I grew up and, you know, the fact that I, you know, my parents were teachers and whatnot. Uh, I really started investing in 2003 here in Calgary, Alberta. And I did probably what a lot of real estate investors uh, start off with, right? The fix and flip. And I got into spec houses and then I got a job at Sun Life. And that's really where I learned about commercial real estate because I was a, a lender at that time. And most of our clients were like pension funds, REITs, um, you know, family offices. But every once in a while, there would be an individual or a, a couple of guys that would come in. And I, I was always like very fascinated. Like, how are you guys buying uh, and I say guys, because back then, most of the people that I was dealing with were, were guys. Um, and they would be buying, say, a five, 10, $20 million building. And I was always really fat, like just curious, like, how are you guys doing it? Well, we're raising money. We're syndicating this deal. Like, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, mm -hmm. This is kind of 2006, 2007. And I would tour the properties and I really get to know them, you know, because we, it, when you're a lender and you have an expense budget, you get to take these clients out and you, you get to really... Um, just get to know them on a personal level. And eventually what happened is uh, in about, uh, I think it was 07, I met my wife um, and obviously we we're married at the time, but she was a designer and her family was, uh, you know, very heavily involved in the development world and commercial real estate. And so my, my father-in-law showed me the ropes, showed me how to find, you know, industrial, multi, retail, office, even though office never really kind of resonated with me and uh, how to find those deals and raise money. And we started to do those kind of um, investments on our own back in about 08. And then, you know, it, I, ever since, I mean, it's 08 doesn't seem that long ago, um, but, it, but it's 13 years or 14 years now. And so yeah. uh, there's been a lot of different deals that we've, we've kind of done in, the in that time. And I think today you want to talk about some of the industrial stuff. So ha happy to dive into that. Yeah. Tell me why you like industrial real estate and what type of industrial real estate do you like to, to target? So um, some of the things that I like about industrial and, you know, I, like I was in Kelowna two weeks ago and my father-in-law, like the two of us were talking and I've got a retail development, right? And, and obviously this was pre-COVID. And so now with what's going on in the world, there's a lot more uncertainty. Like what's the runway? What does retail look like with Amazon, with COVID, with all these things that are going on. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going away, but I, it, it's very hard to know what retail format is going to look like in 10 years, 20 years. Uh, I, I still like it as an asset class. I'll probably still own it, but with industrial and multifamily, those are two asset classes that while there's change, I still have a, a much better view because an industrial building has not dramatically changed in, in the last you know, the, yeah, there's, you know, more ceiling height and there's, you know, d different ways that guys are, are laying them out, but a 1970s industrial building or a 1990s or a 2000, I mean, there's still a strong demand for storage, last mile, you know, small bay, large bay. I mean, it really depends on the type of user that you're going after. And so that's why I like it. It's easy to understand. I mean, if you're, if you're not familiar with industrial users, then it might be, um, you know, th there's a bit of a learning curve, right? But it, you compare that to say an office or retail user, industrial is much easier to kind of wrap your head around. And so those are some of the reasons that I like it from a values perspective, I guess. Who would be an industrial tenant of, of yours and especially specifically this building that you, that you built? Yeah, so we did like 1500 to 2000 foot bays. So these are, these are really small. I mean, you could think of this like, you know, someone that owns uh, a flooring company or maybe they are an electrician or, I mean, even, you know, um, I guess 
the, the term that gets thrown out is showroom or flex. And so sometimes what, what that means is it's a very nice looking building. It almost looks like retail, except you've got 24 foot clear height. And so you'll have this, you know, lots of glass in the front. You can do two levels, right? You'd have what's called mezzanine space. And so what a lot of our users would do, so we had an insurance company. They came in and maybe they had, oh, I don't know, um, call it 40% build out on the main floor. And they might build out 40% on the upstairs or the entire upstairs. It really is up to them. And then in the back, they could have storage, they could have warehousing. And so you can kind of imagine like a flooring company as an example, they might have, you know, 25% built out in the front. And then the balance of their warehouse is where they store things. And you're starting to see a lot of e-commerce uh, go that way, right? You go to a Best Buy, you go to Urban Barn, you go to, uh, I mean, Amazon, like they've got a little bit of a retail or office in the front where they interact with people and it looks nice because it's, it's built out, but in the back, it's, it's truly warehouse. And um, those would be the type of users that, that I'm predominantly working with. Yeah. So you found, uh, I'm, I'm assuming a, a raw piece of land that was obviously zoned for industrial or how did you find the actual piece of property you did you ended up developing? A lot of people, when they're getting out of residential into commercial, one of the questions they ask is like, how do you find these deals? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's no one way, but I would say that by and large, the world of commercial real estate is a fairly tight knit community. And so uh, in this case, it was a broker with a pocket listing. Pocket listing basically means the commercial broker uh, didn't have an official listing on it, but he knew the owner, the developer was interested in selling this three acres. The land was already zoned, so we knew what the zoning would permit. And uh, they brought it to us and we said, well, you have to remember like Calgary is very different than the GTA or Vancouver. And so the market has been soft here since oil kind of dipped. And so this is going back to, I don't know, probably 2016, I think is when we, when we started or, or when we started looking at it, maybe 2017. Uh, yeah, it was 2017. And we, we looked at it, we liked it, but we said, you know what? We don't know how strong the demand is going to be. And, and I'm like so hypersensitive to making sure that there's going to be a market for what it is that I build. And so what I presented to your group, um, I said, you know, one of the things that I want to do is I'll, I'll spend money up front. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, buy the land because we, we, we raised the money fairly quickly. And I can talk about how, how the, the sequence of events went, but we basically went to our brokers. We said, look, we'll offer on this. And, and we ended up, I think we paid pretty much list, list on it, right? You didn't, we didn't negotiate that hard. I mean, we did, but... <laughs> When you're dealing with a $500 million company, they kind of say, that's the price. You, if you like it, let's do a deal. If you don't beat it, we've got someone else. <laughs> and uh, probably not quite that crude, but pretty close. And so we said, okay, um, you get the price, we get the terms. So we asked for four months due diligence. And in that time, we just wanted to verify who's actually going to be the user. And we started off with one site plan. It changed, it changed, it changed. And then eventually we ended up with a site plan that um, was three separate buildings with 24 industrial condos. And an industrial condo is almost like an apartment condo that you would sell off, uh, except it's, you know, much bigger in terms of, um, you know, cu cubic feet because you're going up 24 feet, but it was only 1500 square feet to 2000. So uh, that's what we built. And, and we pre-sold about 70% before we removed conditions. How did you come across that strategy? Um, and, and was that something that, you know, your father-in-law introduced you to, or did you just learn about it organically? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't learn about it from him, but, um, like, because I, I'm, I was at the time and I, I have a brokerage now, but, um, I was helping clients, uh, either rent or buy lease or buy, uh, industrial space. Mm -hmm. And what I started to notice was. Um, the financing through certain banks and through certain government agencies that you could secure was so favorable. I thought, man, like there must be a growing demand for this. And, and so I kind of had a, a thesis, right? I was like, okay, so I'm seeing this, the business owners that I'm dealing with, like the idea of owning versus renting, they have control, they have certainty. Um, you know, 
anybody that that's leased for a certain amount of time, especially in the industrial world, sometimes you just get frustrated with your landlord, right? You got tired space, you got a tenant next to you, you don't like, uh, parking's a pain in the ass, whatever it happens to be, right? Like you just focus on the problems that they're having and can I solve some or all of these? And, um, and so we, like I said, I mean, we had this idea, but um, we didn't know whether or not it was actually going to pan out, right? Like when you're going from rental at one price and then you're going out and selling at 300 bucks a foot, like, I mean, I was just on a trip in Fernie and one of the guys who's like one of the top industrial brokers, he's like, I thought you guys were crazy. He's like, I had, and I said, well, we probably were a little bit crazy, but because we had these pre-sales, I was comfortable. I would have never done this, you know, just kind of crossing my fingers and saying, I think that this'll, this'll work out. So did you, you were conditional still while you were going out and marketing these for sale? Oh yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So you were almost 70% sold before you even removed conditions on the deal. We were, we were over 70% pre-sold. I think we actually had, um, 83 or 85% pre-sold. Like I wanted the whole thing sold. And, um, I was on a show earlier today and I was telling the, uh, the gentleman that was interviewing me, I said, I told my brokers to sell it by 125%. I said, because I know what happens is guys will back out. They'll come back. They'll grind me. They'll retrade me. And I said, I need leverage. Right. And, and there's, um, you know, people want what they can't have. And mm-hmm. so if, if I, if I can go to this buyer, the, when the buyer comes back and it happened, right? It happened mm-hmm. on about six guys. Uh, they would come back and they'd be like, oh, well, I think I should get it for this. Right? And it was never a lot, but it was enough that it eats into your profit because as a mm-hmm. developer, when you pre-sell, the risk is you lock in your upside, right? But I was in a soft market. So I didn't see the market necessarily going up. I was worried about it going down. Right. right. If you're in an up market, then you wouldn't probably pre-sell the whole thing. You would want to hold some back because you know that your, you know, prices are going up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I looked at it and said, I'd rather uh, forego potential profit and just have everything just dialed in. These are the numbers. I've got a fixed price contract and I could look an investor in the eye and say, this is what we're going to do. So the downside now is execution risk, right? Are we going to be able to deliver this product at whatever the price was per square foot that we, that we uh, had under uh, a contract, which we did. We actually came in a little bit under uh, and we were on time. And so it was, you know, it was a very good development from, from all perspectives, but it doesn't mean there wasn't stress and there wasn't guys that came back. But when I can look a guy and say, look, we want you to, you know, buy it at X dollars per square foot or whatever the price is, you don't usually talk in price per square foot. Um, but if you don't, you know, you'd forego your deposit and I got three guys waiting to buy it. Do you mind sharing some, some numbers on this transaction chain a little bit, like talking about, you know, the acquisition of the land and the, the cost to build. Cause I know a lot of people would be interested in how it differs maybe from multifamily space or any other development project. Yeah. Um, so I'll do my best to kind of remember. So we were about nine twenty five an acre. Um, our construction costs, hard costs were about 135, 140 a foot, which is a little bit high, but you have to remember we were building small buildings, lots of demising walls, which means a lot more rooftop units, more overhead doors. So like, even though I will give you numbers, cause I, I, you know, I have, I have no problems with that. Everybody has to understand when they're listening, like, like, like we're on a, uh, uh, our retail development right now. Like we've just had three price increases on steel, PVC, and lumber, right? And so whatever number was around in 2018, even 2020, even six, even 60 days ago, these guys are no longer honoring it, right? And so I don't know if this is going to come back uh, to a more normalized market, but um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we, we sold out for um, over 11 million, I think was the total, the gross sales, if you will. So our investors did well, kind of over 30%. And it was about a 16 month project from start to finish. So, you know, that's a really quick turnaround for sure. So, I mean, is it because it was zoned and basically ready to go that you were, once you removed conditions and subject, you were able to just almost put a shovel in the ground immediately? Um, Well, I mean, like I would have liked to have turned it around in like 12 months because Mm -hmm. construction usually doesn't take as long on these buildings. Like when you watch them, I mean, they probably, they probably put this up in six months. Um, 
the the longest part is getting your dp your dssp and then your building permit yeah. so the dp is your development permit dssp is your deep services that's your storm water and uh drainage overland or or um storm water and so those took the longest and then your building permit is your bp so those um generally whenever you're working with the city because they're not on the same uh trying to say this kind of in a, in a politically correct way, but like, there's no motivation for the city to move super fast. I mean, that's just the reality. Right. And I get it. Like I used to work at the city and so I can sympathize with these guys. Like they get a ton of work, you know, like they're the, the bad guy. And so there's a lot of friction. And so you just have to learn to work with them because, you know, ultimately it's, it's really up to uh, the planner and whoever it is that you're, you're working with. Right. So um, yeah, I mean, they, they moved quick, but, you know, when your architect turns it around in a day, you want it like, you know, you want it tomorrow, right? Like that's, that's kind of the urgency that a lot of developers operate on. Who do you generally like to work with uh, on the investor side and how do you go about, uh, you know, finding investors for a project like this? So the type of investors that we, we typically work with, um, I mean, this isn't the first deal I've done. And so I've been pretty lucky to have investors that have been with me since, 08, I guess, or, or in and about there. And, uh, and so I will, you know, out of respect, I generally will go to those investors first. And then lately, because of the podcast and a little bit more um, uh, branding and, and online marketing, if you will, uh, more people have come to me and, and there's a, a, an interest in some of the stuff that I'm doing. So first and foremost, it's the people that are closest to me. Like, I mean, you can kind of see this circle uh, in my thing. I think of it like concentric circles, right? It's like, who knows, likes, and trusts you already. And what's interesting is even people that I'm coaching on, on raising capital, it's like, they're so reluctant to talk to people that they already, um, are, that are so close to them. Right. And, and I get it right. Because you're, you're concerned about the potential for losing their money. And, and I totally understand that. The challenge is if you're, you know, if, if you have a, a reluctance to, and there's some people that I just don't go to, right? Because, you know, one of my best friends, he's got lots of money. I mean, he could fund, he could fund my deals just with a stroke of a check and he would lose no sleep. Uh, but he's like, Shane, like just as a principal, I don't invest with friends. And, but he gives me a lot of guidance, right? On deal structure and all the rest of it. So there's some people that it's just like, you know what? they're good friends, but you don't have to necessarily talk to them. And then there's other people that have invested in other opportunities. And I kind of look at it. I'll, I'll tell you this. I had a, a good friend of mine who found out that I had done a deal and it, it had performed very well. And he was kind of pissed off that I didn't talk to him. And I was thinking, oh, I was actually, you know, maybe protecting him. But he looked at it and said, well, I invest in these opportunities. I trust you, Shane, like show me the next one. And so that kind of resonates with me now where it's like, look, here's the opportunity. I never oversell it. I mean, you and I were talking right before, like when you've been at this for a while, you, you are way more conservative. You're looking at the downside and I have no problem sharing what the downside is because the last thing I want is an investor to come back and say, well, all you showed me was blue sky, like the wonderful things that could happen. And let's face it, developments or real estate, there, it's illiquid, it's cyclical, uh, there are risks. And so I try to educate people as much as possible so that when they get into a deal, there's less surprises. I mean, you can't eliminate everything, but at least if people have proper expectations, then, and, and they have that, um, like they appreciate it. I mean, a guy that's going to write a hundred, five hundred million dollar check, they know there's risk. And mm -hmm. so the people that all they talk about is like the, you know, just straight upside, um, you turn those people off in a heartbeat. In my experience with my recent in, in conversations with my investors, they actually like that because nobody, I feel like they don't trust me unless they know that I'm making money somewhere along the way because they wouldn't do that in their business. And when you start dealing with these people at an elite level, they're like, okay, how you make money? Cool. This is what, okay, fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as you know, they're, they're, you're not being taking advantage of them in that, in that sense. I mean, that, that's such a good point, Darren, because, um, the reality is, uh, if I'm not paying someone, right, if I was investing passively and, and you're not making any money, if things go sideways, 
what's to keep you and your feet to the fire and working through this deal. But if you've got a real vested interest, A, you got skin in the game, right? And I know that that's something that you and I talk about. And I know you've got, you know, significant amount of skin in the game, hence why it's much easier to raise money that way. Yeah. And two, as long as there's alignment. So yes, I'm going to make a fee up front. Um, and then, uh, you know, to, to manage the project, and it's not a lot, uh, the majority of the money comes on the back end, right? So when it's successful, we both make good money, right? And, and investors like that. Um, yeah. Some guys that try to fee it to death up front, that just frustrates investors and they kind of, you know, it just leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Shane, um, I know we just kind of scraped the surface of this, but I, I, it was really important that we kind of discuss a couple different ways that people can make money in real estate. And I think that probably for a lot of people, industrial is not something that they would have even considered. And I think now hearing your story and your success here, it might be something that at least opens people's eyes to, to a new realm. And like you say, there's, there's so many uh, other opportunities. There's retail, there's commercial, there's uh, mixed use. There's all these kinds of things. So thank you for coming on today and, and really sharing your knowledge with, with my audience. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this session with, with Shane, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions both for Shane and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Shane, thanks so much for being here today. I know you're a super busy guy taking some time out of your day to share your knowledge. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I wish you the best of success on your upcoming projects, and I know we'll be in touch very soon. You bet. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Shane.